Thank you all for being here early on a Saturday morning. Um, this is my talk on building a better RPG. Uh, I'm, my name is Tim Kane. I'm the game director at Obsidian Entertainment. Uh, judging from the number of people coming up to me, I think most of you probably know me as the creator of Fallout. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background. Uh, also, the, the BuzzFeedy uh, title of this talk is Seven Mistakes to Avoid When Making an RPG. You won't believe number six. Uh, but first, some background. That's a little Windows 95 joke. Um, I was talking to somebody last night at dinner. I thought I was one of the youngest people to get into the game industry because I actually, when I was 13, I sent a bunch of designs to Atari. Um, my mother had bought me an Atari VCS console, and I spent so much time on it that poor woman didn't watch any TV shows until I went off to college. But I was really taken with it, and when I was 13, I designed a bunch of new cartridge ideas, and I mailed it to them, and they uh, sent me back this really nice letter along with this $5 uh, check coupon, which I never used because I wanted to keep. Um, I've actually got this framed now in my house. Uh, and they sent back this nice letter saying, you know, we can't hire you because you're 13 and you don't know how to code. So I went, went back to my mom and I convinced her to buy me an Atari 800 computer, and this was in 1979. That was the most powerful graphics computer that was available. Um, it was better than the Apple II, so I know that just made me some enemies right there. Um, but it was also a lot better than the IBM PC. And what happened was, when I was 15, somebody who was two years ahead of me in high school graduated and went to work for a computer game company in Virginia. And they were stuck on making tools for a computer game they were making. And he said, I knew all the extended graphics modes of the Atari 800. And they called me and they couldn't hire me because I was only 15. But they said, as soon as I turned 16, they wanted to talk to me. So on my 16th birthday, I got my driver's license and I drove out to this company and they hired me. So I used to work there after school and all through college, it paid for college. Um, this is my slide for this. That's me at 16. That shirt and those glasses and that hair were very fashionable for 1981. So I heard you guys laughing. So this is technically when my career started. This was 1981. I was working in a tiny little company in Reston, Virginia in the United States. We were making games for uh, cable set-top boxes, but I didn't know much about that. What I did is I made tools for the artists, very high-resolution graphics tools. I think they were a, like a whopping 180 by 120 in resolution, one color. Um, I did it all in basic, and I also taught myself C. So by the time I went to college, I already knew C, which put me way ahead of um, a lot of my friends in engineering school. But what this meant was, this was the start of what's now my 36-year career. Um, I started that little company, it was called Cybron. We ended up making a uh, bridge card game for electronic arts. And even in the 80s, electronic arts was a big thing. So that was a big deal, because I was like, I have something published by electronic arts. The problem was they didn't put my name in the credits since I was part-time. So years later, I'd moved out to California, I'd gone to school out there. I went to Interplay to apply for a job. And there was me and one other candidate and I'd put that I had a, a game credit, and they looked it up, and my name wasn't there. So I almost didn't get the job because of that, but they ended up giving it to me because the other programmer didn't know how to play D&D. <laughs> yeah, because the game I was going to make was Bard's Tale Construction Set. And that was the first game I made uh, at Interplay. So this was in the, this was 1991, and from 1991 on, all I've made is RPGs. It's all I think about, it's all I work on, it's mostly what I play. I play a couple FPSs and a random uh, RTS every now and then. But I've really been playing RPGs since 1991. After Bard's Tale, I worked on a couple games at, at Interplay in like a uh, extra capacity. I think I did, I did sound code on Star Trek. Um, I did air handling on Stonekeep. But in 94, I started making installers for other games that were at Interplay. And that didn't occupy a lot of my time, so I started making engines. And the engine I ended up making was for Fallout. And if you actually own the original disc and you look in the demo folder, and there's a little knight walking around on grass, that is the original engine, isometric engine, that I made before there was anybody else on, when it was just me in a little room, and I'm supposed to be making installers. So after Interplay, um, I started my own company called Troika Games. And these are all my games that came out in the 2000s. They're all from Troika. 
Um, it was Arcanum, which was another original IP, and I call that my kitchen sink game because I didn't have anybody editing me and anybody telling me really not to do something, so I threw every idea I ever had for any RPG into that game. And I like to tell people that game probably has the most of me in it than anything, although there's a lot of me in Fallout, and then all my subsequent games, there's less and less of me in it because there's a bigger and bigger team and a lot more constraints coming from publishers. Um, for example, Temple of Elemental Evil, there were a lot of things laid down by Atari and by um, Wizards of the Coast, which owned D&D at the time. And there's a lot of me in there, but unfortunately the me that's in there is writing, and I found out I'm not nearly a good a writer as I am a system designer or, or a coder. So after Temple, I've sworn off writing, and I just hired professional writers from now on. Uh, and then I worked on Vampire Bloodlines, which I absolutely loved working on. Um, I loved uh, White Wolf. They were great to work with. Um, and then there was Activision. But uh, White Wolf was fantastic, and we loved working on that game. And because it was set in LA, well, we would, used to go up to LA and take pictures of uh, places to go um, put in the game. So it was fun to, like, I'm at this bar because I'm working. Um, that was always fun. And we went to a lot of goth bars and a lot of, um, there's a bar up there that's, made, that's uh, in an old church. And it was fun to go to all those places. Unfortunately, I'm not a very good businessman, so Troika folded in 2005, and I went to Carbine, and in 2014, um, Wildstar came out. At Carbine, I worked half, I was there for six years, I worked three years as a programming director, made an engine from scratch, I, I seem to like making engines, uh, and then I switched over to design director and was working on their classes and the story and the setting. Um, I left Carbine in 2011 and went over to Obsidian, where all my old friends were from Interplay. I already knew about a third of the company on the first day I started there, and I helped them ship South Park, which, given that all my previous games are, a lot of them are rated M, you know, and they had strong language and violence and prostitutes and drugs. South Park was the first game I ever made that I wouldn't show my mother. If, <laughs> if you played that game, you know exactly why I wouldn't show my mother this game. And she asked, some, one time she had FaceTimed me and I was at work, and she asked me what I was doing, and I said, I'm working on a level. And she said, well, show it to me, you know, turn your camera around. And if you've played South Park, the level I was working on at the time was Mr. Slave's ass. <laughs> I was not going to show that to my mother, and uh, you know I never did. I, I wouldn't even. I, I got a PS3 version and a PC version. I never let her see it. Uh, then I got to participate in the first uh, Obsidian crowdfunding, Pillars of Eternity, and that was a huge success. And it was fun to see a lot of people support us and the encouragement we got when we made that game. And it was also fun because I got to watch Josh Sawyer make a game and an original IP for him. You know, he had, he had made Icewind Dale and he had made Fallout New Vegas and, you know, he'd made these great games but he was always another somebody else's IP. And it was really awesome to watch Josh Sawyer make an IP from scratch and to support that. And then we took um, the Pillars of Eternity engine and Brian Hines um, made Tyranny and Tyranny was another original IP and, and Chris Avalon worked on both of those. And it was again fun to watch people there get to make an original IP. Uh, using an existing engine that you know we owned, but we totally revamped it for Tyranny. And what I loved about Tyranny was the idea that you were you, you were playing evil from the beginning. You know, it was a, it was a, uh, a world where evil had won, and that was just really exciting. And it was fun to watch everybody to, to get excited about that. Now I'm actually working on a new IP, which I'm Fergus has told me I'm not allowed to talk about. But I've already told people if you loved Fallout, um, you're going to love this game. This game has a lot of me in it. It, so it's got a very a lot of Fallout and Arcanum style and humor. Um, now, for all these 36 years, I've kept these idea books. And I also really need to dust. Um, this is the mo my most recent one. I've probably got about a dozen or more of these on my shelf. It's kind of like a diary, but it's not like, dear diary, you know, today I met someone. It's full of things like, I had this idea for a game and I wanted to write it down or I'd forget. Um, or I would post-mortem all of my games, and I'm totally brutal at post-morteming my games. Um, sometimes I post-mortem other people's games, that no one will ever see that, but I just do it because if I love your game so much, sometimes I'll post-mortem it for myself because I want, to, I, I want to know how that game could have gotten even better, and I'm always impressed with how other designers make mechanics. In fact, I've post-mortemed um, Fallout 3, New Vegas, and Fallout 4, but no one will ever see those post-mortems. Um, they sit in books like this. But what was great is when Demir asked me to give a talk, I went through all these books and um, I looked at all my old My Game postmortems and I looked at all the mistakes that I had made in my games. 
And I thought, well, a really good way of, of expressing how to make better games is to look at my own games and the mistakes I've made and how I'd fix them. Now, I'm going to use examples from my games. I'm also going to use examples from other games. If I'm using those other games, it's because I think they're great and can be better. It's not because I think they're terrible and I think they, they did a bad thing. It's just because in this otherwise fantastic game, I saw something going, you know, why did they do that? So I'm going to go through uh, the seven mistakes right now. I didn't know there'd be seven when I started. I just started pulling out things. And if I'd done them frequently enough in my games, I said, okay, that's a big mistake that I don't want to make again. So the first one is two steep learning curves. Part of this is because I'm a hardcore RPG gamer. I was under the mistaken notion that a game had to be really complex for it to be good. And I don't even know what hardcore RPG means anymore. I, 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 I'm not sure what it means because I've played a lot of fantastic RPGs that aren't complicated at all. So what I'm trying to do now is I try to reduce the learning curves of my games. And that's not just to make it mass marketable, but everybody, when they first start playing any game, they don't know anything about it. So you have to ease them into all the systems. The systems themselves can be complicated, but they just shouldn't have a steep learning curve. This is like Fallout 1's character creation screen. This is horrible. This is a horrible UI. You, you may have played it. I think it's, it's hideous. Everything on there that looks like a button is a button, but they're all, they all do different things. I mean, the attributes move them up and down, and the skills tag it, and all the buttons at the top can change your age and gender and race, and, but they look totally different than all the other buttons. And this is just a really bad UI. Part of the reason is we didn't have a UI designer on Fallout. UI was done by whatever designer and artist happened to be free that week. But still, I would completely change how I would design this today. Um, you'd think I'd learn from this mistake, but here's um, Arcanum's UI, which is even worse. It may look prettier, but it's got more attributes, it has more skills. I know the later pointer doesn't work, but like the buttons on the top right change what that panel below it displays. And that panel itself has buttons that display what that change what it displays. So rather than put in less skills and less spells and less um, technical skills, what I did is I just hid them so it didn't look complicated. So I didn't scare Sierra, who was publishing it. But still, it was a very complicated game for people to get into. And I again, I wouldn't make, I wouldn't make such a complex um, front end for a, a UI, a, a, an RPG today. Um, if you play the game Path of Exile, I love this game, it's a very dark RPG. This is a small fraction of their skill tree, blown up so you could actually make out some of what the individual skills are. You have to start at one of these uh, faces and grow out into the skill tree. And I played this, and I never felt like I was making my character right because there were just so many choices and it was complex to see where I was gonna go. If you wanna see the whole skill tree, I had to scale it down just to fit it in PowerPoint. This is, I mean, th you, you see this when you first start the game, and you're like, that's, that's, that's too much, that's too much. So I played Fallout 4, too, and um, I liked Fallout 4. People always ask me, what do you think Bethesda does? I liked 3, I liked 4, I loved New Vegas. Um, they're just doing it differently than I do it, but different isn't bad. Um, one of the things they've done is every time they've put out a new Fallout, they've gotten rid of something. So Fallout 3, there were no traits anymore. Fallout 4, they actually got rid of skills, which... Maybe going a little too far, but the character creation looked really simple. Um, this was, you know, I pick my seven, my special stats, and I'm off in, into the game. But then you get to the perk tree, which is now arranged under your stats. It's, this is a small fraction of it. It's actually a lot bigger. It's a little overwhelming. When I first started, I was like, oh, shoot, I'm going to be limited to the perks at the top because of my attributes. And then you, I realized you can raise your attributes, which means they're not really a constraint anymore. You can end up the game with all tens if you just keep playing long enough. So I just keep thinking, you know, there's got to be something better you can do than this. And there's a producer I've worked with since Interplay, and he's, at, he's my producer now at uh, Obsidian, and he loves this quote from Albert Einstein, that everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler than that. Um, and he talks a lot to me about when I'm working on stuff now. He goes, now, could that be simpler? Because he, he doesn't play a lot of RPGs. So if I'm doing something too complicated, he's the first person to critique me. And uh, so I'm trying to make things easier. And what that made me do is I went back to Fallout 4 and I thought, what could I do? What, what treatment could I apply to this and make it kind of a simpler game but still have the, the same strengths it has now? And the first thing I noticed was I should probably get rid of the numbers. Because the numbers don't really mean anything to people when they're starting. Like, what, what's the difference between a three luck and a four luck? 
I mean, do you really know that when you start playing the game? The uh, second thing I noticed, I should probably get rid of luck. <laughs> um, when Chris Taylor and I put together a special, uh, he didn't put in luck, and I kind of made him put it in later um, because I really wanted to hook it into everything. I wanted it in critical hits. I wanted it in special encounters. I wanted it in just hooked up to a lot of low-level systems. The problem with luck is, again, it, it doesn't really lend itself to being numerical. I understand, like, I have okay luck, I have good luck, I have great luck, but what's the difference between a five luck and a six luck? And, and none of the fallouts have really expressed that very well. So I would move that to be a perk. It just makes more sense to have a perk that you can buy a few levels of. Then I started noticing that, hey, of the, three that are of the six that are left, three of them are physical stats, and the other three are mental. So the first thing I do is I, I divide them into two groups. And that right there helps people understand, okay, I have six stats, but there's really three of each type. And of those three, since we don't work numerically, we work very um, visually, I thought, well, what if I put them on a triangle? And what if I started labeling that triangle? So if the triangle's pointed up, whatever's at the top is great, and the ones at the bottom are just okay. And if you flip it, there's only two ways a triangle can be, and if you flip it the other way, then the two at the top are good, which is better than okay, but the one at the bottom is yucky. And that would be the, that would let you do a lot of the things you got out of Fallout. You know when you're making a guy with a low, in, a yucky intelligence, you know, you know that's not gonna be good. Um, and you can do that for both of the, uh, the physical and mental, mental stats. So here's like an example of strength and endurance and agility uh, put onto a triangle. And you can, only, you can rotate it two ways, but those are the only ways you can ever rotate it. So you have a choice of, do I want one to be great and the other two to be okay, or do I want two to be good and one to be yucky? So when I, this is just a thought experiment. I'm not going to go into this much detail on all the different um, mistakes. I just thought I'd run through one of them in detail, like what I would do if I was trying to fix it. So then I thought, well, how would this work if I applied it to like another genre? So then I thought, okay, what would the Incredible Hulk be like if I was doing this? Well, obviously he's really strong and he's not very bright. And the other ones seemed to work out. So then I said, well, does it work for another character? And I thought, okay, Spider-Man. He doesn't have, he can't take the punches like the other superheroes and he's always having trouble with what people think of him, but he's super agile and he's super strong and he's always, he has his spidey senses, so I thought that worked out pretty well. But what does the system actually give us? And what I liked about it was we've gotten rid of all the numbers, which you may love, but what I, and I love math, but I've learned a lot of people, they just start seeing numbers in a game and they're like, yeah, I don't wanna play that game. Or worse, the numbers don't mean anything to them. We've gotten rid of the point by by replacing it with just the shapes of the triangles, and people are very visual, which gets into like attributes are now restricted by geometry. Note there aren't any rules here. There aren't like you only have this many points to spend or you only have this many ways you can turn it. There's no, no restriction. It's all done by the geometry of the, of the um, triangle itself, which adds a, a restriction. And people just get it because it's a, it's a shape, and you've been playing with shapes since you were two years old. So this is something that I'm experimenting with now in my RPG is not just geometry, but other ways you can make a uh, stat system which has a rich attribute system, but doesn't necessarily throw a bunch of numbers and point buys and rules, restrictions of how high you can buy them, or how many points you can spend at the beginning, right at the player, right at the beginning. Which gets me into my next mistake, which is a lot of designers, and myself included, have let math trump psychology. When I was um, an undergraduate, I was getting my computer science degree and they made you take a minor, which I really hated at the time. And I wanted to do AI, which was only in the psychology department. So I took psychology and when I was in there, I learned all this really cool stuff about how the human brain works and how we perceive things and how we're correlational learners. And what that made me realize is you can have two sequences of a, of, with a 25% chance of hitting, but which one would feel better? Where you hit right away and then you miss a few times or you miss a few times and you hit once and then you miss a couple more times. The first one just feels better to people. It just, for, even though it's the same percent chance and in the long run you're still hitting 25% of the time, if you made a game that, that ran the sequences that way, people would feel the first one was better. And that led to something we experimented with which was called the first shot bullseye. When you're playing a game and you put your reticle on somebody and shoot and that's the shot that starts the combat and you're not moving and they're not moving, it's just a guaranteed hit. It's just you automatically get to hit. And when I first put that in, uh, my designers were like, oh my God, that's horrible, that's, people are gonna, it's gonna feel like a cheat. Put it in, people didn't really notice it was in. And part of the reason is, if it takes 12 shots at somebody, 
to kill them, you know, and some of them miss and some of them hit, people aren't going to notice that you shot 11 times instead of 12. But they feel good, really good getting that first shot. And then the later shots, if they're missing, they're thinking, well, it's because I'm moving and they're moving, or my reticle isn't exactly on them. But when somebody's just sitting there and not moving and your reticle's right on them, it feels like you should hit. And that's all just part of psychology. Another example of what we did is, um, if you've heard about variable reward, um, variable reward is when they, they would put pigeons or rats in a cage and they'd push a button or press a lever and every now and then they'd get a food pellet. And it was just completely random how they got the food pellet. It wasn't every third, it wasn't every fifth, it was random. They might get three in a row and then they might hit that button 10 times and not get a pellet. This is called um, gambler's reward. It's why roulette and poker and, and blackjack and all that are so incredibly addictive. It's because they, they use that strategy. Um, it, it's, it's also called random reward conditioning, and it, it's basically the, the rule is just always reward the player at random intervals. It turns out this is the most addictive reward strategy for not just the human brain, but for a lot of animals, and it's extremely hard to extinguish, and this is where things get a little mean. I'm actually suggesting that you design your game to addict the player. I'm actually telling you, make your game so that people want to keep doing something that you want them to do, whether it's doing combat, using their skills, exploring the world. If you use random reward conditioning, it will make them very, it's very difficult for them at a very subconscious level to stop playing. It's that feeling you have when it's three in the morning and you're like, I really should stop playing this game, but I'm sure I'm just gonna find one more good thing. So you just keep playing and the next thing you know it's dawn. That's random reward conditioning. It's affected all of us. So how does this help you? Let's say you're making a game that has a critical hit chance and you're thinking, every time you go up a level, every time you new, buy a new perk or however your game is set up, I'm gonna increase that hit chance. No, you shouldn't do that. That's the backwards way you should do it. What you should do is always have the critical hit chance be a low, non-zero percent chance and instead make the criticals do more damage. People will see that their criticals are doing more damage because when they, when they, whenever they happen, they see a much bigger number come up because you know, I just bought that perk of more criticals and I'm, or better criticals and I'm getting bigger damage numbers. But this, psychologically, is far more addictive than letting them hit, get criticals more frequently. And again, I say, this is kind of mean telling you to do this, but this is exactly what makes people then turn around and tell their friends how good your game is. Your game may not be mathematically better than a very similar game, but it's psychologically far more rewarding. Similar to the last one is um, a mistake. I made this in a lot of my games. Um, you conflate player skill with character skill. And this image is a good example of player skill. It's what I said, it's like, you're, you've got your reticle dead set on somebody in a game, and you, he's not moving, you're not moving, the reticle's not moving, and you press fire and this happens. And you're like, how did that happen? How did the bullet go around him? Um, and the problem is, is you've, now, you've conflated something that the player's controlling with an underlying character skill. So what I always do on my games now is I break down everything that I think the player is going to be able to control, and I call that a player skill, and then all the other ones are called character skills, and when I actually put skills in for the player character, they only control the areas that the player doesn't feel like he has direct um, involvement in. For example, aiming is always going to be player controlled. I don't want to, uh, I've, I've done this in my past games, I'm not going to do any more where the reticle moves around. I think it did that in, in Vampire. I'm not going to do the other thing where even though your reticle's on you, there's a big spread around it. So even though my reticle's on you, I may miss because the, the fiction is, well, you're going to hit anywhere in this inner circle. Um, instead, what I did is I put things like, okay, recoil will be controlled um, by the character skills. So as you put more points into, say, your shotgun skill, after you shoot it and the shotgun goes like this, the speed at which it comes back, the recoil, is sped up. The player doesn't feel like he's controlling that, but he sees an immediate reaction to like, he put new points in there and now his, his, his shotgun's coming back faster. Until finally when he's at max shotgun skill, the shotgun just kind of goes, boom, it just kind of shakes a little bit and he's immediately ready to fire again. It has the mathematical, um, uh, the, the mathematical result that you want, which is the player will be doing more damage per second because he'll be able to fire more frequently, but it's much more psychologically satisfying to the player because he's feeling like the aiming is completely under his control, and the shotgun is getting more and more under his control as his skill goes up, but it doesn't feel like something he as a player is, is making happen. It's something he's putting points into in his character. Similarly, remember the critical as I just talked about? That should be, critical, that should be under character control as well, um, or character skill, whether that's a skill or a perk that makes you 
get more damage as you go up. The player puts points into that or buys extra perks, and then they see themselves doing more critical hit damage, not critically hitting more frequently. Um, this gets my next one, which is just a personal peeve. I threw it in here. <laughs> um, I've worked with a lot of people over the last three and a half decades, uh, producers, programmers, audio people, designers, other programmers, and almost all of them use the word random and use it wrong and make it very difficult to, to work in game design because it's frustrating because they say one thing but they really mean another. And I can explain what I mean. This is a picture from Fallout 4, but this, act, this, this story I'm gonna tell you is actually from Fallout 1. Um, I had a uh, really awesome lead QA guy who'd come in every morning um, for the last three months we were making Fallout and we'd have breakfast at my desk. I used to make this uh, cinnamon bread, which I think when I left Interplay, more people missed the bread than missed me. Um, but he came in and he said, look, I have this problem where I just saw it today where I walked up to somebody, it was really, I was standing like two feet from him and I aimed at his, I did a call shot on his head and it said 95% and I had enough action points to shoot three times and I shot and I missed and I missed two more times, I missed three times in a row. He said, something's wrong with your random number generator. Which is, I've heard that from so many people, something's wrong with your random number generator. Now it's true, what comes with the C and C++ library is a horrible random number generator. But I've been replacing that thing for 30 years. And if you're not replacing it, you should buy a book called Numerical Recipes in C or C++ and replace it immediately. Um, so what I did is I said, let's do some math. I got a 95% chance of missing them, of, of hitting them. So I got a 5% chance to miss. That only comes out, that comes with one in 20 chance of, of missing them. So if you want to miss them twice in a row, that's only a one in 400. And if you're going to miss them three times in a row, that's only one in 8,000, which seems like a lot until you realize you're doing maybe 20 shots per encounter and you have 10 encounters an hour. That means in the space of 40 hours, you should see that happen, which means if he's testing my game all day long, what he just saw happen, he should have been seeing happening every week. And everybody in his group, and there were like five or six QA guys, they should have been seeing this every week. This isn't a mistake, this is exactly what will happen. If he didn't believe me, I had to show him the code, I had to show him the, the random number generator, I had to plot it um, to show that the chi-squared values were correct. He still didn't believe me, he left, he came back with the QA guys, they went over all my math on the whiteboard, they gave me side eye and they left. Um, it's, it's true, it's just psychologically it doesn't feel right, but if you really want this to be random, this is gonna happen. But it's not just restricted to um, the QA guys. This happened to me on Carbine. Um, the audio director came in looking a lot like Bruce Springsteen here. And I was like, what happened? And he said, well, I gave you five songs and I told you, look, I just want you to play them randomly. And I'm like, yeah, I did. I pick a random number from one to five and I play that song. That's what I did for you. I did exactly what you asked. He said, yeah, but I heard song one and then I heard song one again. And I'm like, yeah, that's random for you. And he goes, well, no, you don't understand. I want it to be random. <laughs> I was like, I don't understand. What exactly do you want? And he said, don't ever play it. Don't, I don't want to hear it repeat. So I said, okay, I'll pick a random number and I'll remember the one I played last and I won't repeat. Well, he heard song one, then he heard song two, then he heard song one again. And he was back in my office. And he, I was like, what's, what's the matter? And he goes, it's not random. <laughs> and I was like, you keep saying that word. Um, I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, I don't want to ever hear any of the songs repeat until you've played all the songs. And I was like, okay. So I put them all in an array, shuffled the array, stored the array. So this is a lot more complicated than just picking a number from one to five. So I have to store this. And I just played them the sequence. And I said, we're going to be good, you know. I randomized it, you're not gonna see two in a row. Came back in my office the next day, he heard song 25413, and then 35142. I heard song three twice in a row. And I said, are you just sitting there, just listening to the game? <laughs> All these people shooting at you, you know, loot that ready will be, you know, there's treasure to be looted, and you're just sitting there, and he's, yes. <laughs> so I was like, okay, this is what I did. So I randomized the sequence, in the array, but when I randomized it, I remembered the last one from the previous array before I shuffled it, and I didn't allow that one to be repeated as the first one or the other one, and if it did appear there, I just moved it to another random location in the array. He was happy. <laughs> I mean, this took a week, and, you know, and he walked away, and he's just saying something like, see, was that so hard? I just wanted them to be random. <laughs> 
So then on the same team, same, oh, this is on Wildstar, um, a looting issue came up with one of the designers. And he basically came to my office, and I'm like, what happened? He goes, well, I want a monster to drop loot 20% of the time. But I just killed a ton, a 10 monsters or so, and I didn't see any loot. Something's busted in randomness. And I was like, were you talking to the audio director? <laughs> um, so I said, OK, what do you want me to? So what I did is I, put it, I made the drop chance increase every time you killed someone. So even though he told me 20, it would go like 20, 25, 30, 35. If I figured eventually it would hit 100, it would drop something, and he'd be happy. He still came in and said, I'm seeing lots of monsters. I'm killing lots of monsters that don't have loot. I'm like, what's lots? And he goes, I don't know. It's probably like, I don't know, maybe eight. I don't know. I saw too many. So I'm like, OK. So I put a maximum kill count. So he could put in a number saying, if I killed five and I haven't seen anything drop loot, just force loot to drop. And that made him happy. And he said something like, was that so hard to just make it random? And this is like, this is so far away from random. This is not random. And then I love the epilogue to this. Um, he came to the office a couple weeks later and said, hey, critical hits are set to 20%, but I shot 10 times in a row without seeing one. And I just told him to get out. <laughs> so the moral of this, I'm not going to, is when people say they want this a lot of times, they don't want that. They want this. They want you to keep track of counters and track things, which is so not random, but they keep saying it's random. I think in their head they're thinking it's uniform permutation without repetition. But they're never going to say that to you. They're just going to go make it random. So the next uh, problem I've had, um, I have a thing for linearity. Um, I don't like it in my RPG. I don't like it if I play an RPG and my friend plays an RPG and we both have the same experience. And I'm not even talking, you know, even if we made the same character, I like things to be able to be done in any order. I like you to be able to go to towns in different order and do quests in different order, um, you know, interrupt NPCs and all that. Um, the big thing I like to tell my designers are games are not movies. And I make them repeat that after me. If you recognize this game or this movie, plus two points, but if you went to see it, minus two points. Um, sorry, Blizzard. Any Blizzard people? Whew. Okay, um, I love WoW, by the way, the game. Um, so what I tell them is um, a, a game isn't like a movie or a book or a play or anything. It's not meant to be linear. It's not meant to unfold like a book or a movie. I mean, if, if that was what, um, you know, a game was. I mean, I, I could see an adventure game or other things, but I said I kind of hold RPGs to a different standard. I made my character. This game better react to my character and what I do. That's, what an, that's like, to me, what's at the core of an RPG. And what I would like to use as an example is I had a scripter on Fallout 1, and he made this area, which if you don't recognize, and I could only find a screenshot where all the raiders were dead. This is where Tandy gets kidnapped and taken to in Fallout 1 from Shady Sands, and you have to go rescue her. I had a scripter who one day explained to me all the different ways you could solve this, and it really impressed me because most of it didn't require any scripting. So I was going to walk you through. There's actually seven different ways you can solve this. One of them is, you, of course, what whoever did this did. They just walked in and killed everybody. It's very blunt. It's very brute force. Just go and kill all the raiders, grab Tandy, say we're going home. She follows you. By the way, you don't have to take her home. You can drag her all over the map, and it's like having an extra free companion. The second way is with stealth. You can go around to the back. There's a door in the back, and you can lockpick it. And lockpicking is really quiet, so even though there's a guard that walks around, this building, as long as you don't, he's never quite near you, you're fine. And you can just walk in, and once you've picked that door, you, just, you can walk directly to Tandy without finding any guards, say, hey, I'm here to rescue you, and you leave out the back door. There's a, a similar method using explosives, where you take C4 dynamite, and you put it on the door. If, if you don't have a good lock pick, or, you're lock, uh, or you don't even take lock pick at all, you can do this, and it will blow open the door. The problem with this one is, um, because the guards can hear, if he's too close, the one walking around, her, and he hears you, he'll come over and fight you. But even then, you only have to fight one. But if you do it carefully, you can blow open that door and not fight anybody. You just wait for him to be on the other side of the building when you do it. And again, you can just walk in, grab Tandy, walk out. There's another one where you can do a speech, where you can walk up to um, the main raider, and you have a really high speech skill, and you're like, look, you better let me take Tandy, or there's going to be a whole bunch of people at your doorstep, and you're going to be very unhappy. And you have to have a good speech skill, and it checks that. But if, if it is, he's like, yeah, I didn't realize who she was. You can take her. Now, that did require him. Like, the first three only required, didn't require anything. They all used emergent rules that were already in the game. This one required a tiny bit of dialogue. 
So did this one. You could just walk up to the, the leader and say, what if I gave you a thousand caps? Could I just leave here with Tandy? And he's like, sure. He takes your caps, you go grab Tandy and you leave. Again, it didn't require any um, scripting, it just required a little bit of dialogue work. Then there was another one which I thought was incredibly clever of him. He said, hey, we're not using the unarmed skill very much. So you could go up to the leader and if your unarmed combat skill was high enough, you could walk up and say, I want to fight you one-on-one, -on -one, no weapons, we're just going to punch each other and the first one to 25%, and the first one to almost being killed loses and, I get, and the other person gets to keep Tandy forever. And uh, what was interesting about this was it required a little bit of scripting because if you select that in dialogue, you had to put all the other raiders on you know, non-aggressive, non and then you just fight the, uh, the leader. And there's another script trigger at 25% health where he goes, okay, I give up. I thought that was incredibly clever because it wasn't much work. It was a, like, he, it was a trivial amount of scripting, and it, came, it gave a really good use of a skill that doesn't come into play a lot in Fallout. But then his seventh one was really clever, and I even told him no one's ever going to see this. Basically, if you put on a raider outfit and your luck is high enough, you can just walk into camp and walk by all of them and they don't say anything to you. And you walk in and he's like, hey, Tandy, and you guys walk out. That required some scripting, but it was a clever use of luck and, and armor that already existed. The only thing I told him is no one is ever going to find that solution. I got this from a forum post of somebody who found all seven solutions and was writing about it. And that made me realize players are always going to be super clever and they're always going to figure out whatever you're gonna do in your game. Don't, don't underestimate the player, he's gonna figure out what you're gonna do. Uh, my sixth mistake is, don't, is being non-reactive like that pan. Um, I think RPGs should be incredibly over the top reactive to everything the player does. And I mean that in both um, NPCs, like being reactive, being dramatic, and I also mean that the player should track what you're doing, or the game should track what the player's doing and monitor that and give, and give um, changes to the game based on that. I love Skyrim. I got 160 hours sunk into Skyrim. I do not understand the lizard race because this guy, I see him all the time as a shopkeeper. Is he happy? Is he angry? Is he, is he happy I'm back? I can't tell from his expressions. I can't tell from his voice. He always just says, welcome to my shop. He says something about treasures. Um, and I thought that was a, a, a kind of an oversight on their part because they could have really had this guy because I'm in first person, you know, like, hey, it's you. You buy a lot of stuff here. Why don't I give you 5% off today? Um, they don't do that. I, I think my NPCs, I try to make them like this. That dog is not happy, and I know he's not happy, and, I, and it's very trivial to show, especially in first person. I think reactivity should be over the top. You should be thinking you're making like a children's cartoon, or if you ever watch anything on Nickelodeon, everything is very dramatic, and very over the top, and that's what your NPCs should be like. And you may think, well, I don't really, I, I'm not making a first person game, or I, I don't have a lot of, uh, you know, my, my, the scale of my NPCs are pretty small. So what I did is I went back to Arcanum and I worked out how we did reactivity in the game. Uh, this is a screenshot of the beginning of my favorite where the two guys were fighting and this guy's got tech and the other guy's got magic and the guy, magic guy pulls out a glowing sword and so the tech guy just shoots him in the face. Um, that's not relevant to what I'm gonna say but I just, I like that part of Arcanum. Um, so what we did in Arcanum was whenever you talk to someone we had what we call generated dialogue, which was actually a procedural system back before a lot of people were talking about doing procedural systems. This is back in 98. Whenever you walked up to a, an NPC in Arcanum, the first thing they would do is look to see if you had any followers. So if you were a necromancer and you walked up with a bunch of zombies, they would be like, oh, and this is the best part. They, they, they gave a response based on what class, that social class they were, like were they a nobleman, were they a shopkeeper, were they a peasant, and what social class you were, or what race, or, or if they wanted to say something, um, if there, was, if there was no uh, entry in the table for a social class uh, reaction, they'd go to race. So it'd be like orc to elf or orc to another orc. So they'd look at what like, the people around you, and let's say you had a bunch of zombies. Another wizard might go, hey, don't let them track dirt in here. Where a shopkeeper would be like, oh my God, there's you know, dead people following you. Because that was just, it, was, it was fun that they would say something about what you're bringing in. If you came in with a fire elemental, they'd really react. They'd be like, hey, don't burn down my shop with that guy. They would also then, and this was all in order, they'd look to see if you had any spells on you that were currently active. Especially, I'd look for invisibility in Polymorph. If you walked into a shopkeeper and said something while you were invisible, he'd look around and go, who said that? And he wouldn't start dialogue. So you'd have to turn off the spell. If you said it to a wizard, the wizard wouldn't even look at you. He wouldn't even rotate, because it was a nice magic game. He'd just go, turn off the invisibility, or, or you know, I'm, ta I'm not talking to you. And that was really cool. And they did the same thing if you were Polymorph. If you walked in as a sheep, 
um, the shopkeeper would just go like, get out of my shop. And the, uh, and the wizard would be like, again, turn off polymorph, I'm not talking to you. It was just fun for the player to have that reaction. We also made a bunch of armor and we tag it as um, requiring a special reaction. I think the only thing we had was we had artifact level and we had scary. So we had like a big Viking helmet and a big barbarian outfit and that was marked as scary and people would be like, oh my God, who are you? Um, we had to put a special check in for naked because apparently players love to go into your, in their towns and take off all their clothes to see if anybody will notice. And since Arcanum was a Victorian, you, you had undies on. But people would, would walk in and just you know, say, hey, I wanna buy something. And the, and the shopkeeper would say things like, hey, no shoes, no pants, no service. Um, uh, they would actually check your beauty stat. We had a beauty stat, which is a physical stat. So if it didn't have anything else to check, it would just go, you know, you know can I help you? They'd have a, a nicer reaction to you if you were pretty because we were being very um, uh, superficial in this game. Um, if you were ugly, they would say mean things to you, which isn't nice, but it's fun to have that kind of reaction in the game. And it also reminds you, hey, you used your beauty as a dump stat, and now you're going to be reminded every single time you talk to an NPC because they're gonna say, hey, ugly, what are you doing here? Uh, if, they, if they still don't have anything special to say, they're actually compare their race to yours. So like elves didn't like orcs, so if you were an orc and you walked into an elvish shop, he'd be like, uh, do I have to help you today? Um, or they'd say like, you know, I've always noticed a particular od odiferous quality about you orcs. You know, is there anything you wanna buy? Um, Sometimes they'd look at social class, so a nobleman would say something different to you than a shopkeeper, than a peasant, than a wizard. Um, sometimes they just look at time of day, like now we're talking like we're running out of things to say, but it was still fun to have them say good evening or good morning, depending on what time of day it was. It just made them feel like they were paying attention and the world was alive. And some of this is starting to get a little subconscious. I don't think anybody ever said, hey, it was great that Arcan Arcanum NPCs noticed what time of day it was, but I did hear a lot of comments like it felt very alive, this world. They would also keep track if they'd met you before. So they, they, they would say things like, hey, it's good to see you again, as opposed to just welcome to my shop, do you wanna buy anything? And that was nice, because you were like, I've been here a lot, this guy you know, should remember me. And sometimes they even took into account reaction. If this guy loved you and he's a shopkeeper, he'd offer you a discount. If he hated you and he was a shopkeeper, he might subtly raise all the prices. I don't know how many people notice this happening, but I thought it was a fun thing. And since reaction is based on how you treated him and your beauty, and some other stats, all this stuff factored in to those kind of reactions. Another thing I do with uh, reactivity in games is I always track what the player does, and I started doing end slides in Fallout and I've never stopped doing them, and that's just when you get to the end of the game, the game tells you everything you've done summed up in these large world reactions. This is an end slide for, from Temple where when you get to the end of that game and you have to fight the big demon, oh, there's a spoiler. Um, so you get to the end of the game at the bottom of the temple and there's a big demon, the game will check your alignment. And if you're really, really evil and you've done some horrible stuff getting there, the demon Zuckmoy is like, whoa, you're really kind of, you know, you're worse than I am. I thought I was bad. So you fight and if you can beat her to a low health, she'll stop and go, what if I work for you now? And you can say, nope, and kill her. But you can also say, yeah, you, you work for me. And the game, it, well, the game doesn't end there. What it, end, it, it stops the combat, and she's now a companion. And you can loot all the stuff in the dungeon and leave. And then when the, the game ends there, um, it, one of these slides come up and saying, she's now your unwilling follower. And you, know, you raise the countryside using her, and people speak your name in fear. It's not Zugmoy they're afraid of. It's whatever your character's name is, which just makes you feel like the ultimate badass and that the game recognized that you were. And we had a lot of comments from people who loved this end slide. And then... My final one, I know it's 11. Um, telling horrible stories. I've told some horrible stories. I'm, I'm a bad writer. Snoopy's a bad writer. Um, I'm going to use this slide again. Games are not movies. Games are not books. The reason I stress games are not movies is I've hired a lot of um, people, uh, narrative designers in Southern California who, like, I want to write movies or I want to write plays, and that's why they're there. And I have to tell them, games are not movies. Forget what you learned in script writing class. This is a rule that they teach people in script writing class. They say every character has to advance the plot. And I'm like, no, they don't. Also, big penalty if you solve this movie or the series movie. Um, 
in a movie, yeah, the, it, because if a character has dialogue, it usually means they're advancing the plot. But that's not true in, a, in an RPG. You may have a shopkeeper who just sells things and a, a, you know, a priest in a temple who's just there to heal you or a skill trainer who's just there to you know, let you spend skill points. They're not trying to advance the plot in any way. And if you deleted them, the, plot would, the story of the, the game would not change. Um, sometimes a shopkeeper should just be a shopkeeper. He shouldn't also secretly be the master of assassins or be the villain or be any of a number of things related to the story plot. He's just there to buy your loot. Um, one thing I've seen and I've done in games is where the player's the chosen one. In fact, Fallout kind of tried to subvert this trope by implying that you were, the reason you're going out of the vault is you drew the short straw. And that also explains why a low intelligence character is the one that they're sending out to save the vault. Because you just, you just drew this short straw. We really subverted this in Arcanum by making an NPC really think you were the chosen one. And you make fun of him ruthlessly throughout the entire game by saying, you're not the chosen one. You know, I wouldn't do that. I'm not even good. Um, I plan to kill this person at the end. You know, and you just... I'm, I'm ready for an uh, RPG to be made where you're not made special at the very beginning. And I put this slide in, and I loved Chris Avalon doing this in Torment where you're amnesiac, but now it's done and it needs to be put to, put to bed. <laughs> um, I know why designers do this. They do this because you're, you're, you, the player, don't know anything about the world, so maybe the character shouldn't either, and you can learn together. Well, I think there's a lot better ways of, of uh, making a character ha not have knowledge. In Arcanum, we just said you traveled from a far continent to this new one, and then your, your, your blimp got shot down. So that explains why you don't know anything about this area. But you don't have to say, well, I'm an amnesiac and I don't know who I am and that's why I'm level one and I have no skills. Um, basically, my, my rule here is I said that let the players be anyone they want to be, anybody. And it's the, your job to adjust the story to them. It's not, not vice versa. So let me summarize. And here are the seven big mistakes I think people make. Um, everything from the steep learning curves to telling horrible stories. Um, these are actually mistakes I've made. So learn from my failures. Um, and if anybody had any questions, I think we have some time to take questions, even though it's after 11, right? Okay. Uh, in Temple of Elemental Evil, uh, I played it and I had the impression the first town was really involved and, and uh, all the stories matched together. And then I got into the second town and it felt like, whoops, what, what, what went wrong there? Did they have to finish it? What's the cause for that? I will tell you um, that you're talking about Hamlet and Nolb. We spent as much time in Hamlet as, and Nolb as, as, we, as we did the rest of the game. But what happened was um, we had an 18-month schedule. We had finished all the designs in month three, and we submitted them, and Atari and Watsi approved them. Then in month 16, so we're two months from being done, they retroactively unapproved of most of Nulb. And there was a brothel, which was awesome. It had some great quests in it, um, had some great NPCs in it, had a follower in it. That was awesome. Um, there were some other quest lines, and they basically just said, these have to go. Now, what annoyed me even more than it being month 16 was a lot of these were things that were in the original module. Like, I'd called Gary Gygax, and that was like a highlight of my career. I called Gary Gygax at home to ask him some questions about that module. It's like, I have some questions about some things I don't understand. And we had a long, great talk about it. But those were things that were already in there. They even had, they even had comments about the names, which were directly out of the module. And so some of them I pushed back on, but a lot of them I couldn't. I was like, I don't, we can't do anything. So we didn't have time to change them, so we just cut them. So Noel probably has about a third the content. Um, I know some people were digging around, and some things can be recovered. People were opening up the DAT files and, and recovering, but some of it was actually deleted, so it's just not there anymore. It's, it can't be recovered. I felt really bad about that, but we had no leverage with them to keep it. I tried, I wanted to call Gary Gygax back and say, hey, can you fight for us? But he was having some medical issues at the time, and I was like, this isn't really his problem. So, sorry about that. 
Uh, hi. Uh, so you mentioned like you like giving players the choice. So how do you handle that problem when some choices always feel more rewarding? And I'm going to give you an example. I'm a very shallow player, so I like to kill things in RPGs. And since I'm shallow, I also like the good ending. And often games, like if you go and just kill everyone, they give you like a very somber or bad ending. Right. Like, you know, so how, how do you make me not feel stupid just playing the way I like to play, and obviously you have to reward that guy who you know right. talked to the NPCs and done all that stuff. So, is there a solution? Yeah, I think that's actually two different things. One of them is, as a designer, you shouldn't judge how the player's playing. So I'm perfectly happy if you want to be evil and kill everyone, and I'd actually put something in there saying, if you kill everyone, then there aren't any witnesses. So you actually, there's some bonuses. Maybe you don't get a reaction penalty. Like if you kill a few people on a map and it gives you a reaction penalty, and then you kill everyone on the map, maybe it erases the penalty because you left no one behind. Um, the, the other thing is, I mean, that's obviously a rewarding path because when you're killing all those people, you're getting all their loot. Uh, one solution we did, and we pushed really hard for this, and Josh and I were totally in sync on this, um, on pillars, is we wanted to put most of the XP onto the quests. So if I tell you to go like get some orb, it should, I shouldn't care as the game designer, did you kill everyone in the dungeon and take the orb? Did you sneak by them all and get the orb? Um, did you walk in and say, hey guys, here's a thousand gold, can I buy your shiny orb? I don't care. You go back to the quest giver and say, here's your orb, and that's what gives you the XP. So I actually am lean, starting to lean towards, as in my career, just getting rid of all other sources of XP. Like, you don't get XP for killing people, because if you do that, that's kind of saying killing is better than avoiding. And I think a stealth path and a pacifist, pa pacifist path are really important to have in a game. So I don't like rewarding people for killing anymore because that seems like an outmoded concept. So if you put most of the XP into the quest completion, or even all of it, I think that avoids a lot of these problems. If you were the stealth guy, you're not gonna have any issues over, the, over doing combat or anything else. Just don't leave witnesses. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, Sam, thank you uh, for a wonderful presentation. Um, my question is, like, can you come back a little bit towards uh, representing stats uh, not as numerical values? Can you uh, like, offer some advice or perhaps what are good ways to represent uh, character stats uh, graphically, let's say, without using numbers, basically? Well, that one was using geometry, and of course you don't have to stay on triangles, but like sliders are really good. Um, anything that moves you away from Here's, an, here's numbers and here are rules associated, whether it's point by or whether there's, you, can, you can't go above this or below this. Um, what I like about using sliders and geometry is people are very visual and also the rule can be constructed into the slider. Like if you have a slider that when you move it up, the other ones all move down, um, that's you know, a, a one way you could do it. If you wanna do it numerically, there's something I've always wanted to steal from an old RPG, which they had um, bidding on, on stats, which is um, your characters, and you could use this if you had a party of characters, each character has, instead of points, they have money, and when a, a stat goes up for, um, a stat goes up, like let's say we're now bidding on strength, you have, to, you have to pay for strength, and people bid on whether they wanna be the strongest person, and of course, you have to, if you use most of your money to bid on strength, you have very little money left for the other stats, so those other stats are probably gonna be low. This works really well, I want them to try it in a multiplayer game where before the, you make your character, you don't make your character by yourself, you make your character in a shared environment where it's like, okay, we're gonna play this game, let's bid on what stats you want before you go in. That turns it into something everybody gets, it's an auction, it's kind of psychological, you kind of pretend like you don't really want something like, yeah, $10 on that, I don't really want it. And then when nobody bids, you're like, oh my God, I was willing to go up to $1,000 and I'm now the strongest person in the party and I only spent 10 bucks. Um, there's something clever about that and again, it kind of shows my, I love using psychology in the design of games. And I've never seen any game do an auction like that. But now that we're doing so many online multiplayer games, it's, I think it's just a matter of time before you see something like that show up. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I really loved Witcher 3, and I think they got amazing character design and cutscenes. But I had to quit, not in the main game, but in the extension, because it was too much for me uh, when it comes to cutscenes. And I, I, I really had the feeling I'm watching a movie, it's not interactive anymore. 
So uh, what's your idea towards this uh, really high quality cutscenes, but um, the amount of it and the, when it comes to interactivity? Yeah, I, I should say I loved Witcher 3 too. Um, and I thought it was really awesome. It's, I know what you're talking about with the cutscenes. It also, um, another thing I think Witcher 3 kind of bothered me right at the beginning is when they asked you a lot of questions about, hey, tell me what you did in these old, in this old scenarios. And they were asking me questions and I didn't know how to answer. And so I was, after a while I was just randomly saying things. I'm like, I haven't read the books and I, I didn't play Witcher 1 I, and I didn't finish Witcher 2. So I, I didn't know how to answer some of the questions. But I think what was cool about their cutscenes is their cutscenes really helped establish moods. Um, and I think that really helped ground the world for me because since I didn't understand the world, they explained it to me in the cutscenes. I do agree that maybe they were a little too, they were a little much. Um, but there was one um, quest where they did use cutscenes. It was where you're going after the Baron's um, buried son. I don't remember what, but it turned out to be that, sorry, spoiler, that, that flying baby thing. Um, that was an awesome quest, and there was a lot of cutscenes that you had to get through at the beginning where he'd sit and explain things to you and how things were. Um, I wish they were skippable. If they were skippable, it would probably have been a lot better. Um, if they were skippable, I never figured out how to do it. Um, personally, I kind of shy away from cutscenes in games because I feel like if the, if the level design and the lore that you're giving out in the game in both dialogues and lore objects aren't enough for the player to understand what's going on, then they probably don't want to sit through even a three-minute cutscene movie of, of stuff being explained to them. So I probably would get rid of them or make them skippable. All right, one last question. I'm sorry, so you mentioned that uh, you got your gig in Interplay by having knowledge about D&D. Do you still play pencil and paper RPGs and what is your favorite system? I, I haven't actually played any in a while just because it's hard to get people together and I kind of blame video games for that because before I could get a, a group together and play but now they're all playing MMOs or other games online or Overwatch. Um, so I buy all the the books. Like I have everything for D&D. Um, I bought some new GURPS editions. Uh, I play some unusual older games like Torg. In fact, I, I took Torg's um, points. Um, I think they're called Fate points. Or, no, we call them Fate points in Arcanum, but that, that was lifted directly out of Torg. Um, I think the last game that I played where I had people come over is I resurrected an old first edition AD&D campaign and had five friends come over and play it. And part of it was just we were laughing how bad it was. I just, how awful, it was like, like women's strength was, lim was limited to a lower strength than men's, and um, you couldn't be a certain class if, you're, if your stat was too low in one of, the, one of your six, six stats. And just wizards, it's like, well, at first level, it's like, well, I throw my magic missile, I'm, I'm, I'm done, I'm just sitting here and waiting for the next day. I mean, all that stuff was so bad. But at the same time, I, um, I love the old Judges Guild modules. I don't know if, if they ever got released here, but they were a fantastic set of, of modules and they were done in a universal system so you can still use them today. I actually made, um, I used to play three and a half when it came out, it was after Temple. And um, I loved playing old Judges Code modules with the new three and a half rules. And that just, it just, it was a super fun combination of, of games. But I think that, I probably haven't sat down except for that first edition game and played tabletop since about 2008, which is bad. I still read them though. All right, thank you very much.